Hey folks, Azure Cosmos DB TV. I'm Mark Brown and I've got with me, uh, well, I know at least one frequent guest to this show, uh, Chris. Good to see you again. My question. Yeah, and Alexi, I don't know, have you ever been on the show before, Alexi? I might have been, so like in a secondary role, but yes. <laughs> okay, well, if you've been on the show, then you've, you've been on the show. So, <laughs> Well, welcome back. Uh, Good to see you guys. We haven't done many episodes lately, uh, but I'm super excited that we've got this one for us. Uh, we're going to talk about something that uh, you guys have been working on for a while. Uh, and I think it's uh, fascinating uh, because it brings together a couple of things that I'm deeply interested in and working on a lot. Uh, certainly all of our Gen AI uh, focus and stuff here at Microsoft and absolutely within the Cosmos DB team now that we have uh, announced uh, our vector capabilities and disk and build uh, in 2024. Uh, and then also, uh, Chris, a long running project you've had called Altgraph, uh, which I had you on the show before. Uh, yeah. And I think it's a fascinating uh, project and actually quite perform in an amazing <laughs> in a lot of respects um, where you're built essentially a, a graph database on top of Cosmos NoSQL. And you guys are here back to talk about essentially the evolution of this, if you will, or the AIification of it with Cosmos AI graph. Uh, did I get, did I get the intro right here? Uh, you did, Mark. Yeah. So you can think of uh, Cosmos AI Graph, what Alexi and I are going to present as like the next generation alt graph, right? It's a, so it's a, it's a better graph solution, right? So you can use it simply as a graph solution. Uh, however, right, you know, the, uh, the world has changed, right, in the last few years. And so this is definitely a, an AI solution, a generative AI solution. Uh, Alexi is going to, uh, I'll, I'll kick off the presentation, but Alexi will do a kind of a deep dive on the, on the AI aspects of, uh, of Cosmos AI Graph. Okay. Well, let's get to it, right? That's why people are here. So uh, go ahead, Chris. Uh, we'll have you start and uh, take us away. Let's learn about Cosmos AI Graph. All right. So just to check, can you see my PowerPoint presentation with the title? Oh, yeah, of course. Yep. All right. Awesome. So uh, yeah, so uh, this is uh, Cosmos AI Graph. Um, so Alexi and I are on the uh, America's uh, Cosmos DB uh, Global Black Belt team. Uh, so we've been working on this uh, since the, uh, December. Uh, it's been evolving. Uh, and so we have a, a public GitHub repo. So this is our, our vanity URL, aka ms.caig for Cosmos AI Graph. That'll, that'll redirect to an actual uh, GitHub repo. All right, so uh, I'm sorry, audience, I'm gonna, I'm gonna spam you with, uh, with two rather verbose uh, slides. Uh, it'll get better after that. So uh, just a background, like, like, you know, in short, how did we get here, right? So something fundamental changed in our industry in 2023. Uh, and that was basically generative AI became, uh, you know, a household term, right? Uh, and and there, there's been a, you know, a rush by businesses to kind of uh, harness this incredible power, you know, that's in the form of, you know, uh, Azure Open, Open AI and, and LLMs. Uh, for generative AI. Uh, so specifically, uh, Azure OpenAI, uh, ChatGPT, uh, and Vector Search, right? Uh, so I think all those terms re really weren't in our nomenclature, you know, 18 months ago, you know, but now it's, it's part of our everyday conversation. Uh, so what we've seen is, uh, you know, so what, what Alexi and I and our, and our teammates have seen is that our customers are bringing to us really interesting it's a whole new class of of workloads right it's 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 not like typical application development as we've seen before right they're they're bringing uh graph workloads uh and cosmos AI graph can be used for plain old graphs uh but more interestingly they're bringing uh ai driven graphs and ai driven knowledge graphs right and so the basic idea is that you kind of augment uh your your ai implementation uh with uh with with a graph uh, yes, yeah, so these are these are uh, these workloads are are operational in nature. They're not analytic, you know. So for analytics, you can simply use like Spark and GraphX, for example, and do your do your do your big data um, data crunching, you know, in a in a Spark batch environment. But but Cosmos AI Graph is is for operational uh, real time uh, databases. 
Um, Mark, you mentioned uh, you mentioned Altgraph, right? So that was a solution from 2022. It's been quite successful. You know, customers have used it with with some success. Uh, however, it's been lacking a few things. So uh, the in-memory graph didn't have a query language. Uh, there's no way to uh, define a schema or an ontology. And, and the deployment uh, story was, was suboptimal. It was a single Azure Container uh, instance. So we, we've improved all of that, all three of those major points uh, with Cosmos AI Graph. Now, what's interesting, uh, you know, I think Mark and Alexi can attest to this. Uh, Microsoft is a rather large place, right? Uh, and so there's there's concurrent developments going on. So you know our team started working on this solution, this concept of uh, graph rag that that has morphed into hybrid rag. Uh, Lex and I will talk more about that. Uh, but meanwhile, the, we have an organization called Microsoft Research (MSR), a team of data scientists and PhDs and really really bright people. Uh, so they've been working on on this on uh, without our knowledge, uh, and they were, and we're working without their knowledge on, on, the, on essentially the same concept. Uh, but uh, I like, I'm proud of saying that we actually have an implementation to go along with this concept. So that, 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 that's the background, this, this whole new class of workload, uh, uh, trying to leverage uh, generative AI. All right, so sorry again for the second busy slide. Um, so what exactly is Cosmos AI Graph? So uh, it is a, it's an open source um, uh, GitHub repo. It's, it's a uh, uh, reusable design and it's a set of reference implementations. We have two implementations right now. We anticipate adding a third or fourth. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a set of solutions that customers can simply use. Uh, we're in the process of helping several customers right now uh, implement this, this solution. Uh, just to be clear, just like Allgraph, uh, this is not a Microsoft product uh, or Azure product. It's, it's not a product. It's just a, a reference implementation uh, that customers uh, can use. All right, uh, Mark, I'll uh, I'll describe these things and I'll I'll pause for you to ask any questions you like. So, uh, what is it built on? Right. So it's built on uh, Cosmos V Mongo V Core. So our V Core product supports vector search. Right. That that's the primary reason we built on it. Now, uh, uh, you know, Cosmos to be Mongo V Core is a is a NoSQL database, so we're we're able to store everything, right? Everything for this solution in one database, right? So you don't see uh, an architecture with, uh, you know, maybe a a vector database and a relational database and a NoSQL database. I mean, it's a very simple deployment solution with uh, a single database that stores everything. Your your domain data. Uh, your your AI data, your vectorized data, your your chat history, your token usage, uh, everything. Uh, certainly, it uses Azure Open AI. Uh, it uses RDF technology. Uh, I'll double click into that on the next slide. Uh, RDF, you can think of that as as a branch uh, of graph databases. Um, much like all graph, it uses an in memory uh, graph database. And this is inspired by, by LinkedIn, right? So uh, Alexi and I have talked to the folks at LinkedIn, which is now, of course, a Microsoft property. And, and we asked them, hey, you know, how exactly is your graph, is your, is your huge graph implemented, right? And the short answer is it has an underlying storage technology, but the graph itself is in memory, right? So this, this solution is, is inspired by that, that in-memory graph. Uh, this solution is end-to-end -end Python, right? The entire thing uh, is Python. So there's a web application, there's a backend service. Uh, it's built on a fast API web web framework. We're using a really interesting library called RDF lib uh, that implements the RDF graph. Uh, we're using semantic kernel as an orchestrator. Customers are free to use uh, Langchain. Alternatively, we just found semantic kernel a little bit uh, more stable. Uh, it's a it's a containerized solution, right? So you can deploy it. Uh, we recommend Azure Container Apps. But you can deploy it to Azure Kubernetes service uh, if you wish. Uh, certainly, it supports generative AI. Uh, for the interesting thing is that it supports generative AI for dynamic logic, right? So it's based on generative AI, and uh, we'll we'll double click into that for sure. Um, so R RDF, uh, I'll double click on that. The next slide. Uh, again, the by choosing Cosmos to be V Core, it allows for a simplified uh, architecture using simply one database, right? You don't need you know, seven databases in the solution. It can be very, very simple. 
Now, now the main, uh, you know, intellectual property type aspect of Cosmos AI Graph is this concept of hybrid RAG, right? So what exactly is that? So basically, uh, and, and why? And why did we even come up with such a thing? So the answer, the short answer is vector search is good, right? Vector search is good. However, it doesn't answer all of your questions uh, in the most uh, pertinent manner, right? You can, you can get your RAG data maybe better, faster, cheaper, uh, in other ways. And that's what, that's what we're, we're, uh, we're striving to do. And we are implementing with a hybrid rag pattern. Yeah. It also makes it, uh, your vector queries more efficient. Like if you can have some kind of a quality or range filter, pre-filtering the data before you then apply the vector, uh, search, that's just going to make for a, that's just going to make for a faster query, more efficient query. So, yeah. Yeah, and we'll we'll uh, do a, a brief demo uh, of the user interface, and we'll demonstrate a graph query and, and its speed. All right. So um, okay, just going on a little bit, uh, double clicking into RDF technology. This might be a new concept for much of the audience. Uh, so in, in in graph databases, there's there's two primary branches. There's uh, LPG labeled property graph, and that's like Neo4j and our Cosmos Gremlin. Uh, it thinks of a graph in terms of vertices and edges. RDF is different, and I love the simplicity of it. Um, but in short, RDF stands for Resource Description Framework. Uh, it's it's no more than a set of W3C standards, right? So it's all open standards based. Uh, it's mature. It's been around for 20 years. And if you do any sort of web searching on knowledge graphs, you know, at the very top of the search results, uh, you will see uh, RDF technology, right? So RDF is used for primarily for quote unquote uh, knowledge graphs. Now, one, one uh, really interesting feature of uh, RDF technology is the web ontology language, which has this bizarre uh, acronym, OWL, a little bit uh, dyslexic. Uh, it, it's an XML syntax that allows you to define, you know, your schema in your graph. Um, it, it's a, it's a, like a one day learning curve, but it's, uh, it, it's really quite a, a beautiful syntax actually. Uh, the really interesting thing about RDF is that your data is stored as as an as an array of triples, right? So what what's a triple? A triple is a is a like if you're familiar with Python, it's a tuple, and then the tuple is subject, predicate, and object. It's like so for example, uh, example uh, triple would be Cosmos DB has API vCore, right? Uh, Alexi works at Microsoft. You know, th those would be two examples of, uh, of triples. So your, 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 your graph database is nothing more than a large set of triples with an ontology. Uh, and, and so it's, it's beautifully, it's a beautifully simple design. Uh, Sparkle. So Sparkle is the query language. In my opinion, uh, I've been working with the Gremlin for a while. I've never quite mastered it because it's really quite complex. Uh, likewise, Cypher is pretty complex. Uh, we, we feel that Sparkle is a, is a simpler query language. It's, it's much like, it appears much like SQL, looks more familiar. Uh, and RDFlib is, is our, is the, uh, it's an open source Python library. You can find it on PyPy, P-Y-P-I. Uh, and it, it implements a mutable uh, in-memory RD, RDF graph. So just briefly, where, where is this memory, right? So it's not in Redis, it's not in, in a virtual machine. Uh, the memory is in a Python process that's running in a Docker container, right? So Docker container running a Python process, and the graph is in is in a is in the in, in the memory of the Python uh, process. All right, go for it. Um, I'm going to uh, skip this um, this slide. Uh, customers, please reach out to us. We'd love to help you implement this. Um, it, it, it's a it's a, it's a really good process. Uh, it, it's it, it'll be much simpler than you might imagine. Uh, likewise, Mark and Alexi, I'm going to skip through this page. I think the audience is is generally familiar with vector search and what it is, uh, so we'll skip through this. Uh, uh, I'll spend I'll spend a few seconds. On, I, I'm sorry, Mark. I've said you'd be surprised. Not everybody is yet. So yeah. Still early but, days. A lot of people just getting just getting started. So okay. it's all good. Yeah. yeah. I, I think you might have other vector search uh, episodes, Mark. So I'll 
I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. So, folks, come on back. We got other shows. We can talk. We'll get James Cadella <laughs> back on here. We'll talk all about it. So, yeah, that's yeah. Fine. All right. So, uh, just uh, spend a few seconds on this slide. So, uh, we've learned. You know, Alexi and I have worked with customers, and you know, we've we've implemented this, this solution with them, and we you know we've learned some things, and we've brought it back into the into Cosmos A Graph the solution. One of them is the generation of the ontology. Right. This is kind of a, uh, a learning curve for most customers. So what we can do, we can like scan the input data, observe the structure of their vertices and edges, so the data types, the attribute names, things like that, the relationship names, what, what they're connected to. And based on that kind of mind metadata, we can generate some things. Right. So we can generate the ontology, uh, a really good first first cut at the ontology. And likewise, there's going to be a class that loads Cosmos DB into the RDF uh, lib graph. That that Python class, it could be hundreds of lines of code that can be generated as well. So that's kind of a, a nice uh, feature of the of the implementation. Um, yeah, so we're, we're using generative AI uh, in several ways, right? So uh, Alexa just want to show you this, but you know, uh, in, a, in this conversational system, the user can can enter some some natural language, and then we need to infer what are they trying to do, right? W what are the entities? What what's the intent? What 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 are they? What, what's the question that they that they're asking, and and how it, how is it best to solve it? Uh, so Alexa will talk more about that. Uh, we're gonna have some dynamic generation of Sparkle queries, right? So again, from the natural language. We're going to uh, generate a uh, Sparkle query. Uh, we'll do a demo of that shortly. So I'll, I'll skip on to the next page. I was, that was a bit of a teaser. All right. So this is a screenshot of, of uh, one of the pages I just mentioned. So um, in the user interface that demonstrates these concepts, uh, there's, a, there's a page called the Generate Sparkle Console. And it allows the user to enter in like natural language, like here in the top right. You know, what are the dependencies of the PyPy library named Flask? Yeah, the, the uh, remember I said there's several implementations in, in Cosmos AI Graph. The first one is a is based on uh, a data set that, that we mined from PyPy, which is the um, uh, location where uh, Python libraries are available, right? So we, we, we mined 10, 20,000 libraries and uh, it forms a really nice graph. So for example, you know, a, a library uh, so this is interesting. So software is made of software is made of software, right? So a library has dependencies on other libraries and they have dependencies on other libraries. So it forms a really beautiful graph. So you can ask this question, uh, you know, what are the dependencies of a certain Python library? You click the button and it actually generates the Sparkle query. And so how does it do that, right? So it takes the, the user input as natural language and it adds the, uh, the ontology or the OWL file as a, as a system prompt, passes that to the LLM, and ta-da, we generate the uh, Sparkle query. Now, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll cover this more in uh, the next, uh, when we do the demo of the UI. Yeah, so this is a, when, when Alexi and I first developed this, you know, I, I can say for me personally, this is kind of a quote unquote aha moment. Uh, this is where I personally first saw the power of generative AI, uh, as well as the accuracy. Uh, I'll, I'll digress briefly to say I'm a, I'm a huge fan of GitHub Copilot, right? Uh, I, yeah, and when, when, I'm, when I'm writing code, uh, it'll just automatically fill in code for me. And I'm just, I'm astonished at how good that code is. So it's the same thing when, when we generate the Sparkle. Uh, it's kind of astonishing how, how good it is. I am with you. I used it. Uh... Oh man, it must have been a year ago. I wrote, I'd never used Mongo before, even though I worked in Cosmos. Yes. I'm not really a Mongo user, but I needed to write a data access layer for Mongo or Cosmos Mongo. Um, and there was the docs were in search and Google was confusing. Uh, there's lots of different flavors of the syntax. And I don't know, I just, it just wasn't right. So I just started using GitHub Copilot and uh, it was amazing. It wasn't perfect at first, but it did about 80% of the work and then some Google searching later and I had a pretty tight little data access layer. Yes. I've recently used it to teach myself Python. 
So yes. I've had to actually learn Python. I'm mostly a C sharp guy. I mean, I've done a bunch of other yeah. stuff in the past, but yeah, i lately I just you know, or I know it's whatever. I work for Microsoft, so get, get over it. But anyway, I had to learn Python, uh, and I started started using GitHub Copilot, and it's amazing uh, how good that works. Like I could type in a comment, like do this, yes. and then it would spit out it would spit out code, and it works. And I'm like. Oh my word, that's just amazing. So anyway, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. a huge fan as well of that. What yeah, a, learning yeah, a new so language, just being super productive. Uh, it's great. Yeah, it, 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 one more brief comment here. So uh, I, I think both Alex and I found, you know, so so when we started this project, we were, we were new to Sparkle. Like we, we didn't know RDF, right? So we we're learning, uh, and so we actually used this feature to help us write Sparkle code. Right, we would just type in natural language, and it would, you know, give us the result, and we'd say, "Ah, cool." You know, that that's how you implement that query, right? So, likewise, customers can do that with their solution, right? They, you know, they, they can have a, this as a development page and learn how to how to write proper Sparkle based on natural language. It's it's so really are you bending this straight out of an LLM? Uh, are you training it? Are you are you uh, using rag pattern to pass in a bunch of data and other stuff how do you yeah how, for, how, for for that one mark uh we're simply it, it's amazing we're just pat, we're creating a simple prompt alexa can uh expand on this but we're passing a simple prompt saying this is the uh user prompt right the user natural language and then as a system mm -hmm. prompt we're passing in the ontology right and the and the our prompt simply says hey you know you are you are a generator of sparkle code uh here's the here's the natural language here's the ontology you know, go to it, uh, and and it and it does it. Yeah, there's quite a few. Wow. So basically, uh, the only thing you're using to augment is the ontology, and that's it. Yes. Even it's ontology human, can be generated too. And there's quite few prompt engineering techniques that we use where we actually explain it what it needs to do and give it examples of what the final result needs to look like, and it generates mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. Fascinating. It's machines building machines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, let, let me let me just kind of walk through exactly what hybrid rag is and this uh, fictitious conversation that maybe isn't so fictitious. Right. So, again, the, the, the domain for, for our reference implementation graph is, is this uh, set of Python libraries, all their dependencies, their authors, things of that nature. And, you know, so just on the right side of the screen, you know, this is kind of a, you know, how the rag pattern works. You know, you might have some user input. It's natural language. Uh, the challenge, right? The challenge is for us as system uh, developers to provide uh, the necessarily RAG uh, data, retrieval augmented generation data, to augment the LLM to answer the particular user input. Uh, that together is combined into a prompt that is passed to the LLM, uh, and it produces output. Right. So the critical, well, there's a couple of critical things there. So, so how, how, how one crafts the, the prompt uh, is, is a critical uh, factor in success. But more particularly, uh, the, the, you know, this rag data, like how, what exactly is the data that you pass in to the LLM uh, to generate this uh, generative AI? That's, that's the key thing. Uh, and, you know, so vector search is good, right? But Sometimes other solutions are better, right? So uh, are better to answer a certain question. So for example, like in the middle of the page, in this, uh, you might have a conversational AI page in your application. And you know, again, this is a, this is a Python library uh, domain. So the user might say, uh, ask, you know, what is the Python Flask library, right? Super simple uh, utterance, right? That, that the user uh, would say. And, and so, you know, the, the best way to get the RAG data, in our opinion, is just do a database lookup, right? We don't, for, for that one, we don't need generative AI, right? It's better, much faster, much cheaper to just do a beta database lookup. Now, the challenge is how do you understand the entities and how do you understand the intent of this? Uh, and Alexia will talk more about that. But for some questions, uh, I guess the point being, some questions you can just determine what the, and this column is our strategy. Uh, so this is a strategy for obtaining the RAG data. So we are determining that simply database lookup is the best way to get that RAG data. So we simply read, read Cosmos vCore, 
get the Flask document that has a description uh, attribute, and we pass that as RAG data. So that's the first question. The next question is, I mean, you might, a uh, user might ask, okay, cool, I have Flask. Uh, what are its dependencies, right? And so, you know, the, a vector search isn't going to help you much here. It, it'll find, vector search will find similarities of Flask, but that's not what the question is. The question is, what are its dependencies, right? And, and that, that question is best answered by a graph. Uh, you know, uh, so, so this is where the in-memory graph is, is uh, queried. Maybe the next question is, okay, here's Flask. Next question is, what are the alternatives to Flask that use async, you know, asynchronous processing. So this is obviously a, a vector search because it's a semantic uh, matching similarity search, right? So we're looking for similar uh, web frameworks that are asynchronous. Uh, I might maybe the next question is who is the author? Again, uh, in the context is Flask. That would be another database lookup. Uh, maybe uh, the next question would be what other libraries did she write? Right, so given that author, we can traverse that author's libraries that, that uh, he or she has authored. Right, that would be another graph search. Um, maybe the next question is, you know, display a graph of all her libraries and their dependencies. So, in, in this fictitious conversation, uh, only one uh, question was answered by a vector, uh, and then the rest were either graph or database rag. Uh, so again, we, we feel that that the hybrid rag approach can yield better, faster, cheaper RAG data. One other comment to add is that right now we have three uh, um, uh, sources for the RAG data. We could add a fourth. We could add, add Azure AI search. We could add something else, right? So th there's essentially no limit in terms of where to get the best data. That's very cool. Uh, I like this a lot. All right. Uh, OK, you got more or are we? Uh... Uh, yeah, I, yeah, uh, I have uh, one more. So basically the architecture is, uh, it's all Python. Uh, it, it deployed Azure Container Apps. There's, there's simply two nodes. You can have a web node and a graph node. In Azure Container Apps, you can specify a different uh, number of these nodes as well as different size, right? So the, the, so the graph node may be uh, a larger memory footprint than, than, the, than the web nodes. Uh, the graph is loaded. Uh, again, so the key point here is that the underlying data is stored in Cosmos. Cosmos isn't a graph, right? Cosmos is just the underlying data store, but the data is read from Cosmos and instantiated into the in-memory graph. So, so the graph only exists in memory in this process. So in the interest of time, I'll move off of this. And all right, so let me let me do a quick uh, quick demo of a couple pages and then I'll pass it to Alexi. Okay. All right, so um, yeah, so this user interface is designed to explain and demonstrate these concepts as opposed to, uh, you know, implementing a certain you know, actual business application, right? So here is a, a Sparkle console where the user can simply enter a Sparkle query and execute it. So let's do that. I'm just going to click uh, submit. And you might have seen that the response came back immediately. So it, it took three uh, one thousandths of a second to execute that graph query. Uh, it consumes zero Cosmos RUs because number one, it's, it's uh, vCore, but number two, the graph is in memory, right? So there's no disk I.O. involved in solving for that query. Uh, just as a demonstration, so we, you can produce a, a visualization. So I, I'm going to see the bill of materials or the graph of the Flask library. So the query came back in uh, very few, two, 200, one hundredths of a second. You know, we can visualize it with D3.js. You can, you know, modify it. You can click into the nodes, et cetera. So this is just a, a demonstration of how you can implement, you know, an actual graph uh, with this solution uh, based on Sparkle. Now, the more interesting thing, uh, so back, back to this UI, uh, back to what I already showed is the generation of Sparkle. So uh, I'm just going to click this, this. This is the same uh, utterance that I, I showed in a screenshot uh, earlier. So just let's do it real time. So I clicked it. And there we go. I mean, it took a couple of seconds to generate that. That uh, I'm sorry. Took a couple of seconds to uh, to generate that query. We can execute it. Execution time is crazy fast. You know, four one thousandths of a second again because it's in memory. Um, yeah. So that's generate Sparkle. The the next page is conversational AI, and I think we should pass the baton uh, to Alexi to talk about the conversational nature of this. 
as well as a you know much deeper dive on the on the AI aspects of of all of this. Okay, uh, sounds good, Alexi. Let's uh, maybe take it away. Give us sure. A, a um, thank you, Mark, and, and thanks, Chris. Um, so I'm going to uh, explain how this uh, conversation AI works. So first off, let's start with something really really simple. Uh, we're going to look up uh, record flask as you have heard from Chris, we have a data set that represents uh, PyPy library. So uh, record flask in it should probably mean um, something about, you know, a library called flask. And as you can see, the result comes back pretty fast. Uh, what we're actually doing here, uh, we're trying to de detect the intent of the user uh, first before we actually determine which store to send it to. In this particular instance, we actually didn't send it. Um, we, we, we sent it to database, and that's what this rack strategy uh, tells us. But how did we determine that? We didn't even actually send a single request to Gen AI for detecting intention. We simply determined that there's some simple utterances in the question itself uh, that probably will force us to look up uh, the record uh, in the database anyway. So we just do a shortcut and we send it to a database query. Um, let's do something, you know, uh, slightly more complicated. Let's say, let's ask it, like for example, you know, what are the dependencies of library Flask, right? And uh, when we do this, of course, we do need to detect the intent with the help of generative AI because this is slightly more complicated question. We didn't detect any simple utterances in it, uh, so it comes back with this particular response. And it says Flask is lightweight web application framework in Python. Its core dependencies include uh, Vertscook and Jinja2, uh, Clique, uh, It's Dangerous, you know, four dependencies essentially. How did it determine that? We actually traversed it using the graph. We detected based on this question using Gen AI that it's pro it probably belongs to a graph because there's word dependencies in it, and that probably requires some connection search and traverse all the graph and so on. But once we traverse the graph, obviously we can get additional details from the graph itself if they are there, uh, like descriptions of each particular vertex. Or we could send the another query to um, to the database uh, or even a vector search and uh, uh, augment the results this way and only then send them uh, for completion to uh, GPT. And uh, GPT obviously came back with a nicely formatted answer for us, you know, that could literally be just, uh, you know, copied and pasted. Um, you know, something more complicated, let's say, uh, you know, if we wanted to ask, you know, what are the two asynchronous alternatives to this library? Notice that we don't even mention Flask library anymore because we're actually, you know, following the best practice and we're sending, you know, uh, the last few responses along the way. Um, in the, in the prompt so that it knows what the context is. So in this particular case, it actually determined that the best strategy would be vector search. Because remember, we actually have a vector search with the vectorized uh, set of data uh, as well in Cosmos DB now, and uh, we're, we're, we're using that. So what are the two alternatives, Fast API uh, and Scenic? Uh, so you know, how did it determine that? I mean, vector itself, the strategy was uh, determined probably because there's a word alternative in there because vector search is best when you're looking for something similar, alternative, similarities, and so on. And therefore, you know, we correct, AI correctly determined that it's vector search and we pull from the vector search the records that mention Flask somewhere in the description and simply say that, uh, you know, uh, those are the alternatives way to, uh, to implement uh, applications. And if we want to do even slightly more complicated query, like what are the two synchronous alternatives that use Pydantic? Um, as you know, there's a you know very popular Pydantic library uh, in Python that is often used. Um, and uh, if we ask this kind of question, it also comes back with search. Again, alternative, draw it, but it also filtered on Pydantic. So it, it only selected the ones that actually are based on Pydantic, on from Starlet specifically and FastAPI. So um, 
this is all good. You know, we have uh, a way to provide feedback. For example, if you know certain types of questions require different type of strategy, you know, you could provide a feedback, or you could look at the prompts and see, you know, what exactly do we send to Gen AI, right? And uh, you know, maybe correct uh, the questions based on on these prompts. So another thing I wanted to show is, um, you know, this this baseline you know chris alluded uh to the fact that we're trying to essentially come up with a better version uh of baseline rag and you know i want to highlight a few things that are currently deficient in baseline rack you know why is it not enough because majority of people out there even majority of our customers are actually doing baseline rack Regardless of the underlying technology that might be used in a simple vector database, a dedicated database that, uh, uh, for vector uh, storage, they might be using a vector capability of their existing database. Uh, they might be using some search engine, but nevertheless, in most cases, they use baseline rack. Why is it not enough? Uh, first, as Chris highlighted, um, it does miss the right information in the data uh, because it might not know you know, the word dependency it might not actually be able to traverse the graph because it doesn't have a graph. It simply has the vectorized versions of the same exact records that you find in your primary database. No uh, aggregations, uh, no computations on them, no graph, nothing. Uh, it's just the same data, uh, just in vector form. Uh, so it leads to lower accuracy of your Gen AI solution in general. Uh, it, uh, surprisingly enough, it actually forces the user to use as much uh, of the modal context window as possible because you want to provide as much context as possible uh, in the in the prompt and therefore you tend to maximize the utilization of these tokens by providing uh, as many vectors that you pull uh, or as many documents that you pull from your database by doing the vector search because you're thinking that GPT might actually miss some important context. Uh, and then, you know, that obviously leads to higher cost for inferencing. And then it requires, it requires pre generation of the uh, embeddings for the entire data set. And imagine if you have, you know, multi terabyte or even petabyte data set, that's just not economically feasible to uh, vectorize it all. Um, and, and, you know, continued generation of embeddings might be required as well because the data changes too. And, 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 and what for? Because they, could be just you know very few questions coming in from the users after you uh, uh, vectorize your entire data set. Now it also requires pre-population of uh, semantic index such as you know facets, column level statistics, and something like uh, Azure AI search. Uh, but how do you do that? You you simply guess what the questions are going to be about, uh, and you create facets that might or might not meet the demands of the users who will be using this uh, system. So compare that to a uh, graph approach where you actually do have a uh, canonical representation of the data that is created typically and that represents this you know so-called digital twin of uh, your your real world pro uh, problem domain so what does uh cosmos ai graph bring into the table to address this uh first you know as chris alluded we uh we help you to actually generate the knowledge graph out of the existing data. And uh, that's that's marked as optional component here, but it is implemented currently. And uh, you can adopt it to your own data set. And uh, it detects the user intent, as I showed. And uh, it also uh, provides the scalable graph database and index within memory model. Uh, we're using RDF Lib for that. Uh, it also provides the reference hybrid rag pattern implementation using the knowledge graph and vector database and the raw database. So we're using only these three sources, but uh, something like Azure AI search could also be added as yet another hybrid search engine. And uh, it also gives you the graph query generator using uh, generative AI uh, as the mechanism to convert natural language query to the uh, uh, graph query uh, language. Now, uh, here's the architecture of the solution. So I'll, I'll walk you through uh, this architecture. Let me just put it in the presentation mode here. There you go. Um, so there's two paths here, cold paths and the hot paths. So cold paths is something that happens before. 
the solution is used. So essentially, that's something that um, you know allows you to generate that graph data, put it, persist it in Cosmos DB. We're using Cosmos DB as a persistent store for it. Uh, so uh, with step number one, user selects the gra the data for the graph. You know, it could be a set of CSV files, for example. Um, you know, Excel files, whatever. Um, that you know represents the structural data, and uh, our graph generator will essentially uh, dump them in a JSON form, um, uh, uh, and uh, also as it processes them, it will generate the ontology as well, and uh, it will dump them to Cosmos DB. So in the class, when the user question comes in, that's step number five. Uh, you know, uh, it, it is taken by a web component that we also provide in the solution uh, that is going to essentially take the natural language query from the user, uh, send it to uh, one of the GPT models, and uh, based on it, it will generate Spark. But before it does it, of course, it needs to send a an ontology. So step number four, when we instantiate the uh, uh, in-memory graph microservice, we actually load that ontology along with the triples, uh, along with the uh, you know graph data from Cosmos DB. And uh, that ontology is going to serve us as a context because it's essentially a graph schema. So when we send the request to OpenAI, uh, essentially we give it the ontology, natural language, and ask it to generate Spark. That's what Chris has showed in, uh, in his demo before. And then once the uh, Sparkle query comes in, uh, we execute it on that in-memory graph. And RDF lib allows us to traverse it very, very fast. And um, uh, again, this all happens if the intent in step number seven is recognized as a graph. But the intent might not be uh, uh, to query the graph, it might be to actually pull the record from the original database. And in that case, we'll simply send the request to Cosmos DB, bypassing the whole graph traversal or vector lookup and whatnot. The intent could also be, you know, something that uh, requires a vector search. And in that case, we'll send it to the vector store only. Again, we're using Cosmos DB for MongoDB vCore for that, uh, but you can plug in any other technology, Azure AI search or some dedicated vector database as well. And um, then our orchestration essentially will determine whether there is enough output or rather input in this case for GPT to work with. And if there's not enough, we can try the graph or the raw data store again. And uh, we can essentially combine the results from all three searches in a single prompt that we send to ChatGPT. And uh, in step number 12, we send the whole thing for completion. We get the completion uh, for uh, for the prompt graph um, uh, results, and uh, we send the completion back to the user here. The steps on the right are optional, but uh, you can utilize them to fill in Cosmos DB with source data. Um, you know, using data factory from all of these sources. You can uh, also utilize something like Microsoft Fabric with the data mirrored from Cosmos DB to analyze what was captured. For example, you might utilize it uh, to implement something like semantic cache. You know, if you capture enough of uh, uh, prompts and completions, you could say which ones are most popular, which completions are actually popular completions to respond to a particular type of question. And in that case, you might uh, you know, bypass uh, the whole cycle with ChatGPT and simply send the completion from the semantic cache. Uh, again, you do need to analyze it though. And therefore, uh, you know, something like Fabric uh, with its Spark capabilities uh, could be used. So and Azure um, again is used- Explain that again. I missed the- how, so you could use it as a semantic cache, but that's using vector search on the prompts, right? Or it's not. No, semantic cache. Uh, uh, yes, it does use uh, it does use uh, um, uh, vector search in Cosmos DB. Okay. But when the data gets mirrored, uh, again, it could be analyzed, uh, you know, in something like Fabric, or any other analytics uh, analytic uh, analytical uh, uh, system uh, where you can, uh, you know, 
uh, go through the records and find out which ones are responding better to what questions based on the feedback that we collect. Uh, which ones should be removed because they're duplicate? Which ones should be prioritized higher uh, because there are more complete responses? You know, you can't do that in the database uh, very efficiently. You do need something like, you know, analytical store and yeah. uh, and the system and the engine that uh, Fabric provides. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. That's a cool use case, actually. Yep. Uh, so uh, very, you know, quick call to action here. Uh, there is a, a public repo that we published, and uh, Chris has already given the URL for that, aka.ms slash CAIG, uh, Cosmos AI Graph. Um, we do encourage you to explore it, you know, deploy it to your Azure subscription. Uh, there is a script, very easy script to execute to do that. Um, you can contribute via pull requests uh, to it. Uh, you can provide as much feedback, positive or negative, as possible. And obviously, we do want to hear your use cases. About, we want to hear about your data sets that might or might not be um, um, uh, covered by this implementation or you know, baseline rec for that matter. And uh, we, we might be able to help you to implement this uh, hybrid rec solution as well. We do have resources for that. Thank you, Mark. Very, very cool, you guys. Uh, I think really nice evolution of your Cosmos all graph uh, there, gentlemen. And uh, yeah. this is a, you know, it, I, I mean, you wouldn't do this if there wasn't an ask for it, right? I mean, I know you guys, I mean, you are you are basically as close to the customers as you can possibly get, right? So yes. uh, you guys don't do it thing unless there's customer need for this thing and there clearly is uh i i even hear this right like customers want to do they want they want graphs they want they want to infuse ai into graphs basically uh and graphs are very powerful and this is this is even more powerful this this graph yeah. rag i guess you could call it yeah if i could mark let me add one more comment about the uh conversational ai page that uh, alexi uh, demonstrated so uh, we, we feel that there's several be best practices uh, built into that, right? So, uh, and, and again, uh, Alex and I went to FabricConf uh, in Las Vegas uh, a few months ago, and we attended a session on, you know, best practices for user interfaces. And, and one was to provide, uh, you know, give the, give the user the ability to, to provide feedback, right? Like, you know, to say, hey, this doesn't make sense. It's a hallucination or, hey, you know, this, this nailed it. You know, but but give the user ability to provide feedback. So we, we provided that. Another thing I want to say about the the conversational AI page is that, and you might have noticed uh, at the top left there was a conversation ID prominently displayed in the UI, and so that that resolves to like a document a, uh, ID in Cosmos DB. So the entire conversation is stored as a as a JSON document in Cosmos in the conversations container, and it contains like the prompt history, the chat history token utilization, any feedback, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, so that, that lends itself to, you know, downstream analysis, right? To make sure that your system is optimized. So, you know, what we imagine that customers would use that, uh, do that analysis on those conversation documents to, to optimize, you know, their prompts and, and their, their entire system. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is great guys. Uh, very, very cool. I encourage everyone. I've been, I actually took and made it a little quick banner here as well, Chris, when you were starting out and I put a nice little banner there for folks and uh, showed that nice. a couple of times. So <laughs> I hope people go and yeah, let me make sure I got it right. I did get it right. Okay. <laughs> Don't want to good, send good people job, yeah, thank you. I can type. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, this is great. Uh, I love seeing like, again, the evolution of the, of the all graph into this. Uh, I, you know, like I said, this, this is, uh, it's fascinating stuff, and you guys are just simply amazing. Uh, you straddle the customer and the technical in such a such a good way. Uh, I'm kind of jealous, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you, folks, for joining us. Uh, it was good to have you back. We haven't had too many shows. Uh, we're working on getting more uh, lined up for you with lots of cool stuff, uh, just like you saw here. Uh, so that's it. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Alexi. And thank you, everyone, for joining thank us. We'll you. see you again next time. Thank you, Mark. All right. Thank you, Mark, and everybody. Bye-bye.